shares. I know you just sat down, but would you stand with me? Let's give our best welcome to Pastor Al Robbins this morning. Thank you. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. It's always good to be here. You guys are spoiled. You're, you're, we travel all over the country. We're between churches right now, and I'm not pastoring. I just fill in different places and uh, miss pastoring, but God's got us in a holding pattern. But a lot of great churches, but this is an amazing church. This is amazing. And it just, uh, I always feel better just coming in and hearing the music. In fact, we could literally close right now. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I've already got it, man. I already, I, I, if you felt it already, isn't it great what God's doing? I just love it, man. I just love coming. A little worried that every time I've come the last two years, Pastor Glenn leaves. I think he is worried about stories. And, uh, they say that with counseling and therapy, he'll be back next week. Right now, just kidding. I'm glad you know I'm teasing. He's a great man of God. And uh, the greatest compliment to any teacher is that the student goes beyond. And I say this uh, he's a peer, but he's way ahead of me. And I honor him this morning. I'm, I'm so proud to have a tiny part in his life years ago when I had a, I was a tough drill sergeant then. Uh, I wasn't just a teacher, but I was dean of men and uh, campus pastor, and uh, I also coached him. Somewhere I've got old VHS tapes of him playing football. <laughs> so... And if he's not here next time I preach, I'm going to show those in full length. <laughs> Appreciate him and his family. Appreciate all of you. How many of you are Facebook friends of either my wife or I? Anybody? There's a couple here. It looks like some famous people that I know. Good to see you. <laughs> Is that Len Pace back there? I just had an eye exam, but I think I need to go back. God bless you. We keep sharing dumb things like fake weather reports. <laughs> and I don't have a congregation now, so I just do stuff on Facebook. And it's important to share fake weather reports just to work people up. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> How many Facebook friends? Again, I apologize. I want to apologize about something. I don't know if you saw my post this morning. But I went down early from the wonderful hotel you put us in that I've, I've extended our stay for five years. I didn't mention that. Uh, and uh, it's very nice. Finally slept through the night. It was amazing. I thought I died or something. Got up, and I went down to breakfast, and man, I didn't want to cost the, charge, cost the church any money, so I asked the guy... Does the breakfast come? Oh, no, it doesn't. He says, let me hook you up. So I tipped him 20 bucks because he was, he treated my wife and I to the buffet. Man, he had no idea what I could put away. So, uh, <clears throat> and I asked him, I said, I hope you're working tomorrow. He said, no, I take Mondays off. I said, oh, thanks a lot. So, but I got enough today. I should be fine for till probably Thursday afternoon. Uh, but I'm sitting there reading and reviewing the message and reading uh, the, more of the passage and the context again and, and praying. And then I, I looked down. He had brought me a pot of coffee, and there's a cup, and I'd gone through that pot of coffee. And I remembered back a friend of mine years ago. He, he's with Jesus now, but he is probably 20 years older than me, Pastor Keith Larson, and we'd do events. we fish together. We'd travel, whatever, and I'd preach for him out in western Pennsylvania. And when we'd have coffee, because we're overtired, we'd fish like, I'd drive eight hours, sleep two, drive four north, 
fish 12 hours, drive back to Maine, out in Rochester, New York, the King Salmon Run. And uh, if you love fish, oh my goodness. Anyway, he would always say when we were tired and we'd get a coffee, he'd say, that is Pentecostal gasoline. <laughs> so I, that, that hit me this morning. And I said, you know, I love that guy. So I put a picture of it on Facebook. And don't look for it now. I took it down during the first service <laughs> because I tagged his daughter in it just so she'd remember I was thinking of her dad and their great family, love the Lord. We taught them. I think she was in school with Pastor Glenn. And my daughter said, Dad, that looks terrible. Check your Facebook post. And my wife and I were laughing in the front row right before service this morning. It said that Al Robbins is at the Renaissance Hotel having coffee and with Deborah Ritberg. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so I deleted it. I said, when you tag somebody, sometimes it goes to the top. Like I'm at a hotel in Connecticut with somebody else's wife. Anyway. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> if you're going to tag somebody, I've just learned that this morning. <laughs> By the way, five minutes later, my wife came down, but she hadn't seen the post. Anyway, aren't you glad our kids cover for us old folks that don't know technology? My kids are on me like a fly on flypaper. Dad, that picture's not good. Or, or, I like this one, don't you? You didn't hold the camera high enough. Like, I don't care. Like, no one's going to know I'm fat if I hold it up there, you know? How many know that trick? Oh, it's too close. Your neck. Look. I, hey, I'm 58. I'm just happy to be alive. I don't care. You know what I mean? I work out three times a week. It just doesn't do anything anymore. So, Speaking of wives, I'm glad to have my first wife here with me today. Would you stand and wave? It has been a... It'll be 40 years, August 6th, 40 years. I looked across at her at breakfast and said, now I know why people have me speak, because she is just beautiful, and I appreciate you, honey. And, and I, oh, he's just saying that in front of people. No, ask my kids and ask her. Uh, I am, I'm more in love with her than when we walked the aisle back when we knew it, everything at age 18. And if you'll hang in there, that can happen for you. Amen. Marriage is a commitment. It's not, well, let's spin the wheel and see what happens. No, no, that's one decision I made right, and she's hung in there with me. And, it, you know, you start with big plans. Uh, like when we were in Bible college, our Bible college president, uh, our, our Bible college class president, our senior year, said... Uh, this year, guys, we're going to Disney World all the way to Florida. And we're like, he's crazy. And the way the finances came, Pastor Nick, we ended up uh, traveling three hours south to my home church and everybody slept upstairs in the prayer room. That was our class trip when originally it was going to be Disney World. So, but everybody was fine with it. Uh, this lady here, I'm planning secretly for months. I call friends who take cruises and I don't want to fly to some foreign cruise because the Bible says, lo, I'm with you always, and I'm careful. And I haven't flown since I weighed 150. I'm a little over 160 now, so uh, <laughs> please don't laugh anyway. Uh, so, so I just wanted a New England cruise. You can do New York. Uh, you can do Newport, Rhode Island somewhere on Cape Cod, and then you go around to Boston and up to all the way to Bar Harbor and back. And it was like 12 grand for a New England cruise. Look, for 50 bucks, I can take the Prius and pull into each port from the roadside, <laughs> look out at the water, and get a $5 foot long or $6, whatever they are now. I'm so old, they were five bucks when they first came out. But... Uh, and instead, we had to work on her birthday recently. We're in between churches and everything, and we're doing 
an outdoor flea market, kind of like the elephant's trunk up here. I've never been to it. It sounds great. Brimfield, anybody know antiques? Or My wife makes repurposed signs. No, I'm not trying to sell them. We don't have anything with us. So uh, Now, maybe next time I'll bring the truck. We'll do a little. Anyway, no. But uh, So she had to work on her birthday. Then we're scheduled to work on our anniversary. And I get no pressure from her. So you go through that where you were going to Disney World, but you slept instead in your friend's church. Uh, and we were going to do this cruise around New England. And yet I did do a cruise the day after her birthday. We didn't have to work. I took her on a $26 Portland, Maine Harbor cruise. It was amazing. Absolutely amazing. So we even saw a couple of seals. So she said, you're getting old, because I said, look, there's three of them. And the guy next to me is laughing. He said, there's a lot more than three. I looked again, there's like 25 of them. I thought, I thought they were the rocks. But anyway, when you, you know, when you have a wife that can go through all that stuff and uh, still love you and not pressure you, we better get that cruise. You said we'd have a cruise. It's our 40th anniversary. We need to do something significant. And I just blocked her out. <laughs> you know I'm teasing. Those of you that know me know that. She's been through everything. For three years, you've been praying for her. Uh, right after we were here the first time, they were doing tests and thought she had cancer, did like a, a bunch of exploratory surgery and, and uh, all kinds of probing and cutting, not just arthroscopically. Couldn't find anything. We're testifying, oh, God's healed her. Isn't that great? And then later it happens again. She's had three years of surgeries. And uh, last November they finally found something and uh, been getting treatments and more. And uh, one more chemo. And I'm not going to debate chemo versus natural. We're doing both. You've got to go your own course. You don't need to Google your symptoms you know, you hit your thumb and, oh, I'm dying, you know. No, you hit your thumb, but the first thing comes up, it could be capillary deficiency in your left aorta area, and you probably, do you feel any numbness? Yeah, I'm 58, <laughs> you know. Is there any lower back pain? Yeah, every day. I, you've been dead for four weeks. And uh, when things didn't look good, God has kept us through this. And so many of you are praying. We get so many private messages, and we're just grateful. They, uh, the oncologist told us just Tuesday, she had another one, and said, hey, it looks very clearly that we got everything. Amen. So, uh, so we're still praying and believing. She's still fighting a lot of pain from time to time, and uh, we talked yesterday and then even in the music this morning about how sickness leaves when he comes in. We're just totally believing. We don't even focus on, on what, they, what they said it was. Uh, we focus on our God and know that no, nobody is leaving here. If you're sick today, by the way, you may, the way it's going, you may be healed before things end. And I'm serious. I am, uh, how many of you know God can... When he comes in the room, and he's already here, by the way, all he's got to do is say, boom, you're done. You're, you're all set. And I love it when a doctor is puzzled. Yeah. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. And God's, I just feel to say that God's going to do that. I know he is. I know he is. And we're not leaving until he says so. Amen. And if he really says, it's time, let's go, do you really want to stay another day here? No, if you want to stay, get out on 95 and you'll say, even now, come quickly, Lord Jesus. <laughs> I'm from Maine. It's bad enough in southern Maine. We're four miles from the big city of Dover, New Hampshire. Huge traffic problem. Reminds me of L.A. No, just kidding. Anyway, Father, we thank you for your word. We feel your presence so strongly, God, and and we can see you already begin to loosen bands and healing and fixing and restoring and renewing dreams and repairing marriages, not with a patch, but a full-on miracle change. 
God, you're resurrecting businesses in this service. You're fixing things. You're restoring losses. You're going to fix what was lost. You're going to not only restore it, but it's going to be sevenfold, God. You're going you're to do some great things from your word today. We trust you and thank you and give you the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Anybody here have a dream? Like 20 people? Come on. <laughs> Hello, 911. Yeah, I have some dead people here. <laughs> How many have a dream, a serious dream? Now, this is going to be a harder question. How many have dreams that you just don't even share because people are going to think, man, he's on medication? <laughs> huh? And you share it, and it's like, has anyone ever shared a dream? And when you start to tell it like to your best friend, and they're like, okay, yeah, wow. Hmm. Oh, it's 8.30. You don't even have a watch. I know, but I can sense it. <laughs> I got to go. Have you ever, how many have a dream right now that literally scares you? I love it. Good. I think this church has a couple of dreams. You got 38 people that have perfectly wonderful lives, busy jobs, stuff to do at church, and they're in Panama City meeting with and spreading the gospel all over like peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> with people they've never even met. They don't know them. They're just in there. They're broken people. You heard Pastor Nick hurting people, people that have been abused. They're in schools. They're in services. They're on the street. God bless them right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Let this be the best trip ever. Let this place explode when they come back with the testimonies of what the Lord hath done. In Jesus' name, we speak it and believe it. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That's a dream. I don't know who started that dream, the youth leader or who, but let's take a group to Panama, and then you've got 38 people down there sharing the gospel with no strings attached, not even like some churches do, doing an outreach to fill our own church. Nothing wrong with that because we're trying to reach people too. But when you go somewhere like a foreign country and you just dump out love, they're not even going to come to your church. You're not going to grow and say, well, now we're running 200. No, you're just sharing the gospel in the name of Jesus. Listen, if you have a dream today, remember our God is a living, pouring, restoring, creating, directing, orchestrating God. He looks to order our steps. Now, the older we get, we tend to dream less. We've been burned. We've been hurt. How many have lost money on a dream that didn't work out? Mm. Oh, my goodness. We won't go into any stories today. I'm with you. I'm with you. You, you, you just you invested. And I don't mean like some pyramid scheme, internet, whatever. Call me, I'm the king of Russia, and if you give me your personal info, I will wire nine million into your bank by 4 p.m. today. I don't, I'm not talking about one of those. I'm not talking about one of those scams like a guy that tr I had listed a cargo trailer on Craigslist once, and he wrote and said, I've always wanted one of those vehicles for my wife. A cargo trailer? Uh, <laughs> And so I played along a little bit. And he said, uh, yeah, we're on our honeymoon. I can't come by right now, but I'll send a buyer with a check, whatever. Yeah. And you're saying, oh, honey, we've made it big anyway. Uh, and I wanted to say, oh, which island are you on? We're in Hawaii, too. I'd love to see you. <laughs> Aren't they, these scams are crazy, man, when they call you and a fake number and all that, and it's crazy. So you can lose dreams. You have a dream. If you've been burned enough, anybody struggle to dream sometimes. And I like dreams that are like five minutes, and then the harvest comes. I'm not good with long dreams. <laughs> I don't do too good. Ooh, I want to be president of the United States, and that lasts like five minutes. <laughs> By the way, right now, I wouldn't want the job. It's a challenging season we're in. 
Listen, there's a young man in Scripture that dreamed. He had a dream, and he had a big dream. And he shared the dream. Can I say this? Be careful who you share your dream with. Some of them will run out the other door and say, hey, do you hear what Al said? He's going to, what a, what a, he's not going to, he can't, he's too old. Have you seen the guy? He can't even tie his own shoes. He's not going to be in the Olympics, whatever. I was coming through to go to Rhode Island to take our dog there to stay overnight with our daughter before making the second leg of the trip here, visit our daughter and grandson and son-in-law. He's in the Navy there and stopped to visit. And I drove in to get off the traffic on a Route 1 and drove by Gillette Stadium and went into Bass Pro Shop to use the restroom and buy four or five boats. Anyway, um, (laughs) and I came out after and I, I wanted to put Gillette Stadium in there and I said, I can't believe that I was in the parking lot of Gillette Stadium and nobody ran in to sign me up with a contract as running back. Don't they know what I did 40 years ago? You know what I mean? I don't mean one of those dreams. I don't think I'm going to be a running back, although I calculated with a pastor friend the other day, if I could get a big enough contract, I'd go in and let them plow me into the ground because if I'm out for disability, I'm going to get several million anyway, and we'll at least finish this edition out here. Won't that be great? Listen, Joseph had a real dream that came from God, and he's telling his brothers... uh, I don't think he came in saying, hey, guys, I just want to let you know I've had a dream. You'll all be bowing to me. (laughs) Maybe he would have been okay with that, but then he went further and said, yeah, and then I was dreaming uh, all the planets were, you know, and it's like, and even his father questioned, hmm. But then if you read later on, his father considered what Joseph said. And I don't believe Joseph was arrogant. Sometimes we get a dream from God and we share it and we've told negative people and they're going to, you know, la, 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 I don't want to hear that. And, and sometimes you share a dream and it doesn't mean, yeah, I think I'm going to launch a church in Canada and they're like, well, we don't need any more churches in this town. It's, it's a strange thing about sharing a dream and Joseph shared a dream and in a nutshell, we don't have time to get into it all. Joseph shared his dream, and what happened? They threw him in a pit. Can I point something out today? It wasn't just that he fell in a pit. It wasn't that one of his enemies or co-workers threw him in the pit. It was his brothers that threw him in a pit. Can you imagine being in that pit, and he's there, and his family threw him in, and then they come back to him. And pull him out, but only to sell him into slavery. I'll never forget it. I was just a little kid, and a bunch of kids were walking around town, and one big guy pushed me down. I was really the runt of the litter. Pushed me down on the ground, just being a bully back then. And another kid came up. His name, I won't tell you his name. Casey's here. Anyway, another kid came up and said, don't push him down like that. And I remember, I was probably seven years old. I'm thinking, wow. He said, don't push him down like that. And he started to pick me up, and then he threw me down. He said, let me push him down. And so later, when I became a police officer, I arrested them both. Anyway. (laughs) By the way, I made out okay. But it hit me this morning. You're in the pit. And you, what do my brothers do? And then they come back, and you're thinking, oh, maybe they're saying, sorry about that, buddy. We had a bad morning. And instead, they sell him into slavery, and now he sees nobody. His coat of many colors goes back to his father with blood on it, and they lie about him to their own dad and say he was killed. And Joseph's in prison, and now he's, now he's accused of making a pass when he's done nothing wrong. And he's put into the inner court of prison. And he sits there. I'm already preaching, but I'm setting the stage. He sits there for years. Year after year after year. No, no iPod. No iPhone. No anything. 
no Apple Play, no live streaming harvest service. <laughs> he could have made it, Pastor, if he could have live streamed. How's your connection in cell 52? Mine's lousy over here. There was no internet, no TV, no Christian anything coming in. Think of it. There was no Bible yet. There was no Bible. There was no, I think I'll look up the uh, NIV today. I'd like to see this in the, no, there was nothing. It was Joseph and God, no family, no chaplain, not even a cassette tape or a VHS tape. Come on. No rerun Billy Graham crusades. You know what I'm saying? No chaplain, no visitors, no family. Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, Joseph is in the prison. He's staring at the walls. It's damp, it's cold. There's no federal prison standards. There's nothing. He's in a dungeon, it says. Can you catch it this morning? Do you feel like that in your dream right now? Joseph is sitting there. Mm. And suddenly, in Genesis 41, if you have your Bibles, verse 14. I'm reading from the King James today. I got my old Bible with me here that's held me since high school. Genesis 41, 14 says, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. Here he is in a dungeon. He's done nothing wrong but dream and share his dream. And he's been in a pit for years and he's been faithful. And now suddenly, then Pharaoh called for Joseph. And they brought him hastily, everybody say hastily, out of the dungeon. Tell your neighbor, I'm coming out. Say it like you mean it. I'm coming out. I am not leaving. Can somebody hear me this morning? Would somebody catch this in your spirit, in what you're speaking, and say, I am not leaving this service until I've stepped out of this thing that's bothering me. I am changing in this church today. I don't care if I, well, I can't leave through that door, but I don't care if I leave through here or there or I'm here for, uh, slain out for the rest of the second service, the third service, I don't care. But I am not driving out of this parking lot until I come out of this pit in the name of Jesus. I believe it today. I believe it today. And they came, it says, and they brought him out hastily, stuck, stale, all alone. Nothing, nothing of gospel in nature. No worship team, nothing pouring into his spirit to strengthen him. And he's all alone and everybody, his own brothers have left him. Nobody knows where he is. He knows where he is. God knows where he is and that's all it takes. And when the timing is right, are you ready? Are you seriously ready? Are you ready for God to change things? Are you ready or you're just becoming comfortable? Well, that's my, uh, that's, I have to do that. No, 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 no. He's going to shake everything up. Some people depend on their illness when God wants to fix it. Is anybody catching this? I know that's a little tight, but it's right. Sometimes we're, well, uh, you know, my kids will bring me stuff because I got back stuff and arthritis stuff and all that. And so, Dad, can I bring you the remote? Oh, you sure can. Oh, but we say, oh, okay, if you want to, honey. When you want to say, yeah, and bring me a sandwich too, would you? Come on. <laughs> got to see the rest of this game. Listen, are you ready to come out today? It says they brought him out suddenly and he shaved and he changed his clothes he went from ripped up, dirty, smelly, damp, dark, worn out prison clothes. Didn't even have the nice orange shoes back then. The slip-ons. Huh? You know what I'm saying. I'm taking, I'm taking a minute. Somebody's feeling this today. They brought him out suddenly, and he shaved himself and changed his raiment and came in unto Pharaoh. 
is three quick things. I'm already preaching. I've already got half the message done. Hang with me. Listen, there are three things that will move you today from your pit to your palace. Three things that will move you from your pit to your palace. Number one, be like Joseph in your dreams. Joseph never stopped dreaming. Joseph shared his dream, and he hung to his dream. Instead of saying, never mind, I'm not going to see Pharaoh. You can kill me here. It's not going to do any good. Joseph did not stop Pharaoh when Pharaoh said, okay, you've interpreted the dream. I'm going to make you second in command, and your word is going to be next to mine. Joseph could have said, yeah, sorry. I'm discouraged. I, I don't think so. Yeah. Hey, thanks, but I've heard enough stories like that. Never mind. I'm tired of being hurt. Yeah, 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 I'm going to be second in command. It's not going to work. Never mind. Leave me alone. No. No, Joseph stepped into it because he was a dreamer. Dare to dream. Now, when you don't feel like dreaming, dream again. Of course, the longer we live, we're going to have more and more dreams that don't make it. That maybe we gave up on them or maybe God was refining the dream. Maybe the 10 grand we lost would have been 50 grand we lost down the road if we hadn't learned from the 10 grand. 10 grand is not that expensive an education. Oh, it feels like it because you're going to buy a full tank of gas this week. <laughs> Anybody ever lost money in business? But guess what? It didn't stop Abe Lincoln. It didn't stop other people like Walt Disney, Lucille Ball, and others. Have you ever read that about famous failures? It didn't stop them. They got up. They were rejected. No original ideas. Oh, no original ideas. Really? Walt Disney had no original ideas? Hello? They can write you off, but just wait, because God's the full authority, and he's the one that gave you the dream. Yeah. Joseph never asked for the dream. Maybe you lost the contract. Maybe you went through a tough divorce. Maybe your business failed. I'm here to say, dream again. God sent me here to do nothing but to deliver the mail. And the mail, open it up this morning, it says, dream and 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 don't lay that dream down because God has great things planned. I sure wish this edition was done. I've been looking at a hole for three years, and I'm getting tired of looping around over here. We got this. We, this is all torn up. There's no paving. I got to walk up the stairs and get in here. No need of it. You pull in here. We're a mess. All these big pieces of equipment. They keep blasting rock. Uh, what if we just forget it? What if we just say forget it? Forget it. How many know that's a dream? That's your dream. That's your pastor's dream. That's Pastor Nick's dream. That's Pastor Faith's dream. That's the youth pastor's dream. The children's pastor's dream. The worship pastor's dream. And guess what? Some of you, it's your dream to create more space to reach your cousin or your brother or your mother-in-law, or your son, or your daughter. That's a dream. What if we just say, forget it? How deep are we, Pastor Nick, in this thing? I don't mean in the ground. I mean moolah. How, that's got to be. Let me say, I did a lot of building with my dad and brother. That's over $100,000, I bet. <laughs> I'm going to push it. One forty nine nine. I'll tell you right now. I never did make it in real estate. Uh, I went in, looked at the baptismal tank today. That's one of the greatest pieces of the dream. Right in the middle of that building, right there, is a baptismal tank. And I could hear that tank saying, come on, fill me up, baby. Give me some new believers. Come on, followers of Jesus, followers of Jesus. Have you, you go out, you'll hear that baptismal tank talk to you, I'm telling you. Maybe too much coffee, but I'm telling you, that tank is ready. That tank is a vessel that's ready to go. And guess what? That's happening because we're full of dreamers here. We're not, well, this is enough. Well, we got three, well, this is fine. Don't you like what we have already? 
we were doing a remodeling project in our first church years ago, and, and, and the, the founding pastor's daughter, oh, that was fun. I followed a guy that had been there 52 years before he died, and you didn't move anything. Kids weren't allowed on the platform, and uh, I was the kid that when I was a kid, and they'd say, don't run in God's house, I would say, why not? I think it's awesome. I think God is running today, you know? And... Uh, so we had a lot of changes there, and we're doing a remodel and grabbing at straws. And she said, well, why do we want to expand? Can't they learn just to come early to get a seat? <laughs> and I was leading the meeting. I'm just smiling. Well, that's a good point. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. I don't know how I navigated out of it, but I said, well, maybe Jesus would like us to create some more space. I could be off, but mm, maybe he wants to win the lost. I don't know. It seems like there are a few little pieces of scripture that say, let's grow. Let's bring more people in. Come on. No matter who overlooked you, who walked out on you, no matter how impossible it appears, this is going to be finished. I don't know what we've got. We don't have much booked anyway anymore, but I want to at least visit for that opening service. I want, to, I want to just sit in the back and see it and feel it. This place, you could break that discount glass you got that was cheaper with all the noise. It's going to be amazing. God's coming saying, well, let's hurry up. And God's saying, wait, I'm going to save you 600000 on glass. I think we'll wait for his timing. Come on. Joseph waited until just enough and the knock came on the door and it didn't matter that his family had left him. His father thought he was dead. They'd accused him falsely. It just, that false accusation literally put him in the exact spot to be elevated higher. God's got this. Tell your neighbor God's got this. Listen, whoever and whatever can't limit our God. God is not up there saying, oh, no. Alan and Laura Robbins have no church at all, and now she's been fighting an illness. What are we going to do? I need a board meeting. <laughs> I have offered before to serve on God's advisory panel. <laughs> he just pats me on the head and said, I'm still all set, son. I love you, and I appreciate your humor, but... I'll let you know. God's got this. God's got it. L let me bring it right down. When you're sitting in a room like we were Tuesday, your wife's sitting in a special chair, you're sitting there, and they come in and they gown up and put shields on and rubber gloves and they put a toxic substance in your wife's body that when anything they've touched, they put it in a, they put it in a biohazard bag. Anybody been there? And that's the one you'd love. That you'd do anything. You'd give your life for your wife that you love. And here they are doing that, and they're saying, "Stay back! Don't don't do that." And and if you don't have Jesus in here, if you don't trust Him, you're a wreck. And God has brought us through. In the name of Jesus. And he's going he's gonna to finish the work. In the name of Jesus. I know he is. I know that I know that I know that he is. I know he is. I, I said in the first service, I would not be surprised if when we go back again, they say, we, we don't get this, but now your pain has stopped and everything is done. And it could be during the song we were singing about healing. God can do it. Listen, nothing can limit God. Talk to him, consult him, listen to him, let him give you a dream. Don't do your own dream, man. That's dangerous. <laughs> That's how I've lost some of my money. Come on. Listen to him. He's designed us to dream and to reach and to stretch. Daniel 11.32 says, The people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. I could not be part of a church that's stale and dead and dry. 
I couldn't be part of a church. Oh boy, this is on live right now. I don't care. What have I got to lose at this point? I know a church, good friends of mine, and they're, oh, I'm saying it. Here I go. I may have to come work here, but anyway. <laughs> Their building's been paid for years. They probably have 50 acres of land. Anything they need is covered. And that pastor for years would say, just to let you know, we have a million dollars in the bank. Well, I'm glad, but part of me isn't glad. Our little church poured $750,000 back into 15 missionaries a month the Dream Center and Tommy Barnett in L.A., uh, Teen Challenge, built churches, found a pastor in his 70s that was trying to retire, and they'd never paid him his whole life. He had nothing. He'd lived in an old trailer. Got with my board. They said, let's sew back into them. We helped them retire, and we bought them a house, and we bought them a brand-new car. They'd never had a brand-new car in their life. We went and brought them a brand-new car. We went, we met him at a Ryan Steakhouse, nothing like a good buffet. And we met him, and we, his son is a professor at ORU and a certified counselor. His daughter's an AG's pastor's wife in D.C. We flew everybody in, and we brought him there. We said, look, we're, we're going to buy you that house that we helped you get into. We're going to buy it. We have a closing in 30 days on the piece of property that you used to have. We've merged the churches. We're buying you a house. And then we said, oh, we forgot something at our hotel. Can you follow us back? And we got back to the hotel, and we'd left this brand-new car loaded. Uh, what they wanted, we found out secretly what they'd always wanted was one of those little SUVs. We got them a loaded XLT Ford Escape, and we had a big red bow on the front. And, and at the dinner, at the dinner that day, he knows I'm crazy. I'd known that I called him Bishop. He'd known me since I was 13 and was baptized in the Holy Spirit at his youth camp, little struggling youth camp. Changed my whole life. This youth stuff means so much to me. It's why I'm here today. And I handed him some little John Deere toys and a metal thing, John Deere tractors and animals. He said, what are you doing? He said, "This uh, I don't have any grandkids or anything of that. I said, oh, wait, no, there's a key in there. And he'd been attending a church in another state and he couldn't mow because he was battling lung cancer out of nowhere. And he couldn't mow his lawn. The lawn was up to his knees because the pastor was going to get him a tractor. And some guy in the church said, Pastor, don't do that. That's too much money. I will mow his lawn. The guy lied. And I called our board, and they'd say, yeah, you know what to do. We get him a brand-new John Deere tractor <laughs> with a cart and all that stuff. And we gave him that that day. We had lunch. We said, by the way, your house is paid off. And we're paying that off within 30 days. And then, oh, we forgot something at the hotel. We drove back, and there was his brand-new car. And as sick as he was, my wife has a lot of wisdom. She said, don't let his wife drive. Hand him the keys so he'll know. And we said, thank you for what you've done and what your church has done. I said, no, wait a minute, sir. Don't ever thank me or my church again because we didn't do it. You, you raised that whole harvest for 40-some years in that location, and all we got, we got called in in the last chapter, and all we were, we're just stewards. We're stewards. You did this. You earned this for your family. This is your blessing from God. You've been investing in a bank account all your life, and this is yours. So God's going to take it out. Don't be bitter. Don't let it affect your heart and your mind. Listen. Don't worry about these people that you see in aisle 7 that you don't want to run into at the grocery store. And you're running to aisle 12. Here they are. Suddenly you tell them, we got to go. What's the matter? We got to get groceries. No. I want to go to a different store. No, no, no. Let God heal all that. Don't be bitter. Joseph wasn't bitter. Watch your heart. Guard your integrity. And finally, be like Joseph in your expectancy. How real is our faith, church? How real is our faith? It's fine here in church. Everything's great. But what's it going to be like when you get that medical report or a challenge or, or a check bounces or you have some other issue? Where's our faith? Where's our faith? How deeply do you love him? How great is our trust in the pit? 
God forbid, I don't want any more pits. I want out of this pit. And some are coming out today. But right in the pit, can you trust him? Can you say, God, you're always good. You're it. None of this matters anyway. We're not getting out of here alive anyway. And there's a better day of coming. Come on. There's a better day of coming. There's a new world, a new life. And it's forever. And this temporary cell is not my destination. This is a temporary cell. Yeah, Joseph, but it's been about 17 years. Doesn't matter. I know what my God said. And I'm coming out. This is temporary. It's dirty. It stinks. It's tough. It hurts. I cry a lot. But I'm resting on Galatians 6, 7 through 10. That we are going to reap what we've sown if we faint not. God is bringing us out. In the name of Jesus, Proverbs 13, 12 says, Hope deferred, that delay makes the heart sick, but when desire cometh, it is the tree of life. Listen, Joseph even thrived. Genesis 39, 2 said, Joseph, that the Lord was with him, and he succeeded in everything he did. While in the pit, he succeeded. God did something hastily, rapidly, quickly, suddenly, and God is going to advance you, heal you, restore you, deliver you, rescue you, promote you, vindicate you. Stop explaining. Stop explaining yourself. Let God be your defender. Let him explain it. Let them watch you. Let them view your life. Keep praising God. And when you come out, God will have already fixed it. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Folks, we're closing, but listen, somebody, somebody needs to know God is knocking on your door right now. You're setting in your pit. You're setting in your cell. You came to church today. You didn't even feel good. You're exhausted. If we only knew what you're dealing with back home, but you said, uh, like the woman with the issue of blood, I don't care. I'm coming. I'm coming. I hurt. I'm, I cried all night. But I'm coming. I'm going to harvest time. I'm here, God. I'm here. I don't care. Come on, would you come right now, quickly? If that's you today, would you come to this altar and say, God, I'm stepping out of this pit right now. Come quickly. Come quickly. In the name of Jesus, while I pray, as many, if you're wrestling, if you're in a pit, if you're struggling, would you come right now and say, God, this is my day. This is my experience. This is, this is time to change. I don't care what you do with me, God, but do what you're going to do. I trust you. I believe you. I love you. You're still a healer. You're still a provider. I don't care what my checking account says. You're still a generous God. You're working on my behalf. You're fixing my marriage. You're restoring my business. There's books you haven't even written yet. There are ideas. There are ideas for business that he hasn't even given you yet. Stand strong in the name of Jesus. If he's Lord, then serve him as we're doing today. Father, in Jesus' name, while Pastor Nick comes, I speak deliverance and victory and the knocking on the door of each cell represented today. I speak for a release. I speak for a change. I speak for breakthrough. I speak for victory. Let the blood of Jesus cover everything of the past. We release all bitterness. We choose to be better, not bitter. We release it. We step forward and we move and advance according to your divine plan. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name.